Welcome to Voices, a podcast from the Institute for Human Rights and Business. Here, we're seeking to elevate the range of perspectives on the role of business in the world and in people's everyday lives. My name is Haley St. Dennis. I'm here today with Natalie Galia and Louise Chapel of the Australian Human Rights Institute at the University of New South Wales. We're talking today about the built environment. These are the places where we live, where we work, which have everything to do really with our own ability to lead healthy, fulfilling lives. And you both have such fascinating backgrounds as to how you got into this space. Natalie, it sounds almost inevitable given two decades of working in construction contracting across Australia and the MENA region that you would get in this space partly because of just the lack of women and female leaders. Is that right? That's right. And just to sort of make sense of my own career as a construction professional, but also as somebody who has worked um, out on construction sites across the globe and and seen um, the effect on the people that work on those sites, but also the ones that, you know, are using the built environment later after the construction's completed. And after those two decades or so of sort of direct experience, you went on to formalise your study in terms of a PhD and now your work at University of New South Wales. My focus at my PhD level was on the lack of gender equality in the construction sector in Australia. And um, the construction sector is Australia's most male-dominated sector. So it really looked at why it was that despite all this global movement towards gender equality, why the construction sector in Australia was actually tracking backwards in terms of the participation of women. Louise, it sounds like a really similar sort of lived experience for you as a young girl watching your father, who was an MP, right? And not seeing, I think, women represented in politics in general across Australia. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, my interest in this whole area came through the gender equality avenue. Natalie contacted me when she wanted to start her PhD to think about gender in the construction industry. And I'd actually never had anything to do with the construction industry. And I found some really unique and different ways of operating there once I started looking at it. But I also found lots of similarities with the male-dominated workplaces that I'd been looking at around public policy making and in Australian politics. And gender is just one of the dimensions that can really showcase the intersection of human rights within the wider built environment life cycle. But within construction and Australia really in particular, why would you both say new thinking is needed now? Yeah, look, I think in Australia beyond, I guess, the equity issues on our construction sites, we've really seen a bit of a race to the bottom in terms of the built form that's being produced. We have, you know, at the moment an investigation into, you know, large tower blocks that have been built poorly and have fire hazards, etc. And we also are seeing, you know, a built environment that's really hasn't been constructed with a diverse community in mind. So without thinking about people with abilities or, you know, our ageing population, how they live and exist within the built environment. And then before that, I guess, you know, looking at how our Indigenous people's land has been taken, but also turned into buildings and communities. So, you know, for us, you know, the construction sector is, I guess, one link in the chain, of quite an extensive chain that has an impact on um, a number of people. And a lot of those topics, and also the conversation around climate change, for instance, are really rising to the fore at the moment, particularly in the Australian context. And the other thing that's interesting is that With the introduction here of the Modern Slavery Act, companies, construction companies and developers are also really thinking about the footprint that they have outside of our Mm. our borders and the impact they're having and and their consideration for the sites that they're building, say, in the Middle East or Indonesia or Papua New Guinea. And it's become a very hot topic here to think about, you know, the footprint that we um, businesses in Australia, but also global businesses are having in relation to the built environment. And so can you give us a sense of how this deterioration of standards and enforcement locally is actually playing out in day-to-day work within construction? 
Well, I think it's been very interesting because we've had a couple of examples in Sydney now where these large residential tower blocks have actually been evacuated and people have been left without uh, access to their housing for months and months at a time. And one of the issues this is really raised is around building standards and planning. And I think it's sort of shaken up the government uh, in a way. And there is sort of a background to this, which is around the Grenfell Tower mm. issue and that whole disaster and how close we've come ourselves to potentially having that similar sort of issue. So framing it in human rights terms is very important to us to get a new way of in, engaging in this area. So it's not just talking about the technicalities of what's gone wrong, but putting humans at the centre of this to say, well, what's the human cost when we don't do these things properly? What are the human rights violations that occur when building standards aren't upheld or the buildings are built with supply chains that have modern slavery in them or when we haven't designed the spaces correctly to take into account the diversity of the communities that are surrounding them. So I think the human rights lens brings a very powerful new tool into play with government planners, developers and so on that just really hasn't been used in the Australian context very much at all. And as Nat said, not just in the Australian context, but moving out of Australia to the way we impact the environment elsewhere in the world through our construction and our mining industries and, and other extractive uh, industries that are so big uh, in the Australian scene. And can you say a little more about that in terms of Australia's footprint, you know, within the wider Asia Pacific region and beyond? Is it very much the same case? Is it worse because they're away from homes? Yeah, I, I think there's been a real lack of research into this area, actually. We have crises pop up from time to time where we know that Australian companies have been involved in destroying local habitats, polluting uh, important waterways, building on sites, which has meant the displacement of people. But there isn't really very strong regulation around that outside our borders. So a lot of this goes unremarked and the accountability that many of these companies have have not really come to the fore in the Australian environment. So I think there's a lot of work to be done in terms of researching this and also then in developing regulations, something similar to the Modern Slavery Act that can look across borders and make sure that Australian companies are being held to account for what they are doing. And we think this is particularly important right now. The Australian government has made a strong commitment to helping develop the Pacific region and be very alert to the challenges that are involved in, in being involved in those local communities and making sure that what we're doing is respectful of the people living in those communities, their Indigenous people, their their environments and so on, rather than just sort of neo-colonial approach of coming in and telling them what they need and, and for us to, to build that. And that's coming in an environment where geopolitically it's really interesting because of China's move through the One Belt, One Road project and it ramping up construction projects right across the Asia-Pacific region. So it's happening at a very critical and also fragile political time. Right. The moment is kind of ripe for either opportunity or disaster, depending on how it's seized. I, and looking at some of the points you just made there, what strikes me is the earlier the better when it comes to the life cycle of a building or project. And construction is obviously kind of ground zero for that footprint. But prior to that is a huge round of investment and development. Are you seeing particular interest from the investment community around sort of a rights-based conversation or is that still really a kind of uphill battle at the moment? I just want to reiterate that that is exactly, it is sometimes too late to, by the time you've got onto a construction site, we saw that with our research in the gender equality area. 
that a lot of the pressures that are forced onto contractors when they're building the building could have been considered in the scoping out of the project um, in the tender phase and also by investors. I think that at the moment, we're gauging probably interest across the board from contractors right through up to um, investors and definitely developers in terms of the interest that we've had when we've started to do a bit of a a listen and a learn tour um, within the Australian landscape. And just to go back to Louise's point earlier, and there certainly is an appetite from particularly Australian companies who are operating offshore Mm. to ensure that they're doing their human rights due diligence and that they're actually taking an active step in that approach. So I think that there will be an appetite there. You know, it's a tricky industry because when you're building something in a remote location, you know, it's very far from head office, you know, where they're doing human rights audits. And so I think the sector is grappling with how do you do something that's applied on the ground, you know, at the coalface. And it's really important that we break down this approach to so that companies can and project teams are able to apply a human rights approach to their construction and their built environment delivery. Absolutely. And I can imagine, as you say, on the ground level, the pressures of time and cost and project overrun are very potent arguments against which human rights based approaches need to be made, right? That's a difficult business case, but it's one that you can really start to elucidate when you look at, you know, the countless numbers of of stories and the headlines, Grenfell being the most recent and most tragic, but certainly not the last um, and certainly not the only. So uh, how are you finding sort of making that business case and are there particular ways in which that really starts to sort of switch the light bulb on for certain contractors or operators on the ground? I mean, I think one of the the really powerful things is is storytelling, really. And we found that in our own research around gender inequality, speaking back to construction companies about the actual experiences of people on the ground. And we did that project through ethnography. So we're really drawing on people's very personal experiences there. And they were really powerful and cut through. And I think things like you know, the tragedies that's coming out of Grimp or the stories of the people that are being evicted from their houses because they're falling apart. Or we've recently shown a really powerful film here called The Opposition, which is set in Papua New Guinea and is around the eviction of an informal settlement for the development of a tourist resort. Those sorts of stories, I think, really are important tools to reach both the people in the sector and audiences more broadly to raise awareness about these issues and try and get some traction there. And I also think we've had an important development in Australia around there's a big coal mine being developed up in North Queensland, being um, developed by an Indian company. And one of our major banks has refused to provide finance for that. And That's been a really important development in terms of just suggesting that sustainability now is a very important investment issue. And the point that we want to make is that it's human sustainability and environmental sustainability that's important, not just one or the other. And working with finance companies and trying to bake this in right from the start, that human dignity has to be at the centre of the whole construction life cycle, is what we've got um, as our sort of mission here. The built environment, I think, is second to none in terms of the sort of positive stories that can be told about the way a building or a town square or a park has changed someone's life for the better. Have you seen or can you share a few examples of where a project or a building has really gotten that right? <laughs> I mean, in the, in the Australian context, possibly, you know, the, the iconic building like the Sydney Opera House 
becomes part of the community. You know, that's the place now where we have an arts festival built around the Opera House, uh, a light festival called Vivid. Mm. And they get the most incredible crowds there, young and old and visitors from all across the world coming to see the sails being used as a canvas, which is very beautiful and really striking. It's a place where people gather and meet and hold all sorts of different events, interact with the building in, in ways that probably were never envisaged in the mm. first place, like using the forecourt for big rock concerts and other things. Mm. And it did become the site of real controversy in the last year when a company wanted to advertise a horse race, so gambling basically. There was such outrage in the community that it was being used for commercial purposes and gambling at that. You really got a sense of how the community felt so strongly attached to that particular building and how we see it as as ours and defining us. Today's times, it feels like those sorts of examples of something really bringing people together are few and far between and need to be protected that much more carefully. And I, I guess I've got another example, Haley. I'm just starting work on a, a study on a um, on the construction of a hospital precinct here in Sydney. And whilst you know traditionally there's been the focus on getting buildings up or health infrastructure up quickly so that they can service the needs and the health needs of the community, this project, the client and the contractor came together and decided that they would consider the health needs and the social sustainability of the workforce building that hospital as well as the patients at the end of the project. So this research um, that I'm doing is they've decided to measure the well-being of the workforce and their next of kin, their family members. Whilst this project is run on a five-day week, traditionally a construction job would, here in Australia would run a six, maybe even a seven-day week particularly towards the end of the job. So I think that, you know, this example of baking in human rights right from the beginning, it's not just about what the building is delivering to the people at the end, but it's how it's affecting the lives of the people who are also constructing the building and able to deliver these these buildings that are so important and so integral in our in our life. Absolutely. Wow. Well, looking at this area, it's it's always so striking how enormous it is. It's a lot to engage with. What can be done, really, if you had any final words of wisdom on the real root causes that need to be focused on? Well, I think this approach of looking across the life cycle is really, really important. And I think what we're engaged in in this project is identifying what needs to happen at each stage and making those stages link up with each other. So I think Nat's example there of the wellbeing on the construction site is an important example of part of that, which is looking at the workers as well as the end users. But we need to also think about how it's financed, what it's meant to, to get access to that land and ensuring that that hasn't trampled on the rights of Indigenous peoples or of local communities, making sure that it's sustainable. So I think we, what we need to do is be building frameworks at each stage of the construction life cycle and making sure those frameworks all link together so that it's not just the design aspect that's right, but that when design gets to be constructed that the construction aspect is right and they're paying attention to who the the end users are going to be so it's just making sure that we pay attention to the next stage in the cycle and get out of our silos and stop just thinking about what's going on within our professional level or area of interest I think what we've really got to pay attention to is is linking the bits of the puzzle together because you could have the most beautiful design but then use exploited migrant workers to build it and then you know you lose the human dignity as part of that cycle it undermines everything yeah and can you tell us a little more about the new draft principles for dignity in the built environment that our coalition yourselves at the australian human rights institute ihrb but also Raoul Wallenberg Institute for Human Rights and Humanitarian Law, as well as Rafto Foundation for Human Rights, 
all, all four have come together to, to offer out these principles that really get at exactly that, that root cause you identified there, which is the siloing across the life cycle and the need to link all that up. Yes. I mean, this is a really important and an exciting development to bring together this partnership, which is international and looking across this life cycle of land, planning and finance, design, construction, management and use and demolition and redevelopment and making sure that human dignity is put at the centre of every stage of that cycle and then thinking about this in terms of a human rights approach. So really thinking clearly around who's accountable, who is actively participating in each of these phases, um, that there is a non-discrimination lens and also that there is transparency across the life cycle. Yeah, and, you know, we're in a process of of consulting now and, and the feedback we're getting across all of these aspects of the life cycle have been very, very positive. The companies, law firms, contractors, they're all very keen to hear more about this. There's a willingness there. There's just a um, question mark around how to do it. So that's really what we're involved in and trying to do the research to ensure that we understand what their needs are and that we're designing something that's fit for purpose. So it's very nice to have this period of consultation and then hoping to launch these principles in a formal sense around this October, September, October next year. Wonderful. Well, IHRB is certainly delighted to be part of the work you're doing and we'll continue on that for the foreseeable future. But good luck in the meantime in Australia and we wish you well on your work. Thank you so much, Hayley. Thank you both.